Good morning. Welcome to the open meeting of the Federal Communications Commission on July 13th, 2021, which is also the long awaited date for the transition of low power television stations and translators from analog to digital service. And with that out of the way, Madam Secretary, would you please introduce our agenda for today? Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Good morning to you and good morning, Commissioners. For today's meeting, you will hear four items for your consideration. First, you will consider a third report and order that would amend the rules for the Secure and Trusted Communications Network Reimbursement Program, consistent with modifications adopted by Congress in the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. The item would also clarify certain aspects of the reimbursement program. Second, you will consider a notice of proposed rulemaking proposing revisions to section 15.255 of the rule governing short range radar operations in the 64 to 71 gigahertz band. Third, you will consider an order that would amend rules to require the remaining applications and reports to be filed electronically in the International Bureau Filing System or IBFS and eliminate duplicative paper filing requirements. Fourth, you will consider an enforcement action. This is your agenda for today. Please note item three, updating broadcast radio technical rules, and item six, promoting techno technological solutions to combat contraband wireless device use in correctional facilities. And as listed on the commission's July 6th sunshine notice, were adopted by the commission and deleted from today's agenda. The first item on your agenda is entitled, Protecting Against National Security Threats to the Communications Supply Chain Through FCC Programs, and will be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau. Chris Monte, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Ms. Monteith, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Good morning to you and commissioners. The Wireline Competition Bureau is pleased to present for your consideration a third report and order as part of the, as part of the commission's ongoing efforts to remove, replace, and dispose of insecure communications equipment and services through the Secure and Trusted Communications Networks Reimbursement Program and to protect the integrity of our nation's communications networks and the supply chain. I would like to thank the Bureau's supply chain team for their hard work on this item, as well as our colleagues in the Public Safety and Homeland Security and Wireless Telecommunications Bureaus and the Offices of Economics and Analytics, Managing Director and General Counsel for their helpful input. Elizabeth Petner, Attorney Advisor in the Wireline Competition Bureau's Competition Policy Division will now present the item. Elizabeth. Thanks, Chris. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. Recognizing the critical impact that broadband has on our work, education, healthcare, and personal connections, and the damage that attacks on these networks that supply these services can and do cause, the Commission has taken several steps to secure our nation's communications networks and communication supply chain from those who would harm the United States and its people. In addition to designating as national security threats, the Chinese companies Huawei and ZTE, the Commission, as directed by Congress in the Secure and Trusted Communications Networks Act, published a list of covered equipment and services that pose a threat to the United States and its people and established the Secure and Trusted Communications Networks Reimbursement Program to reimburse carriers for reasonable costs incurred in removing, replacing, and disposing of Huawei and ZTE equipment and services in their networks. On December 27, 2020, the Consolidated Appropriations Act 2021 became law, appropriating $1.895 billion to fund the Commission's reimbursement program and amending in certain respects the Secure and Trusted Communications Networks Act. Today's item, if adopted, would implement those amendments 
to ensure that the Commission's rules are consistent with Congress's direction in the Consolidated Appropriations Act. First, the third report and order would increase the customer eligibility cap for participation in the reimbursement program from providers of advanced communication services with 2 million or fewer customers to those with 10 million or fewer customers. Second, the order would modify the equipment and services eligible for reimbursement to include all communications equipment and services produced or provided by Huawei and ZTE. Furthermore, to preserve the alignment of the equipment and services subject to removal under the Commission's remove and replace requirement and the reimbursement program, the order would require eligible telecommunications carriers receiving universal service fund support and reimbursement program participants to remove all Huawei and ZTE communications equipment and services from their networks. Third, the order would establish June 30th, 2020 as the cutoff date by which communications equipment and services must have been obtained to be eligible for reimbursement program funds. Fourth, the order would enact the prioritization scheme provided for by Congress in the Consolidated Appropriations Act if demand for reimbursement program funding exceeds the $1.95 billion appropriated by Congress. Specifically, the reimbursement program would prioritize applicants with 2 million or fewer customers, then accredited public or private non-commercial educational institutions providing their own facilities-based educational broadband service, and lastly, any remaining eligible applicants. Fifth, consistent with the Consolidation Appropriations Act, the order would adopt a definition of provider of advanced communication services to include, for the purposes of the reimbursement program, accredited public or private non-commercial educational institutions providing their own facilities-based educational broadband and healthcare providers and libraries providing advanced communication service. Lastly, the order would clarify some reimbursement program requirements to assist eligible providers as they prepare to seek reimbursement for reasonable expenses related to the removal, replacement, and disposal of covered communications equipment and services. The Bureau recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear comments from the bench and we'll begin with Commissioner Carr. Well, thanks so much to the Bureau team for all your hard work on this. I'm uh, heartened that we're continuing to make uh, quick progress on implementing uh, rip and replace uh, and glad we're making these changes to line up our decisions with the latest uh, statutory directives. It, it has my support. Thank you. Commissioner Starks. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Today's order marks another significant milestone in our efforts to eliminate untrustworthy equipment from America's communications networks. Though our work is far from complete, I want to take this opportunity, obviously, to reflect on how far we've come over just the last two years. We faced unprecedented challenges. When I first convened the Find It, Fix It, Fund It workshop in June of 2019, we focused on understanding the scope of the problem in U.S. networks, developing solutions for threats posed by Huawei and ZTE equipment, and implementing a complex removal and replacement process. In the workshop, we heard from a broad cross-section of experts, including a number of small carriers. And at the time, uh, funding posed a daunting challenge for them. I remember hearing Christopher Reno, Director of Accounting at Union Telephone, walk through the cost for equipment, software, installation, and optimization needed to offer mobile service across the challenging terrain of his company's footprint. Reno explained that it was a, quote, extraordinary expense, close quote, associated with such a rip and replace solution that is something that Union and other carriers, quote, could not bear. And so I'm grateful that Congress has empowered us to drive execution with the $1.895 billion in funding. The reimbursement plan we adopt today will, consistent with those congressional instructions, prioritize smaller carriers and establish an orderly process for getting those funds out to operators. This is very good news. But that does not altogether mean that the road ahead will be easy. When I checked in again with Union Telephone last week, they outlined challenges they face in replacing insecure equipment, even with the financial support provided today. Some of those difficulties include short construction seasons limited by severe weather, 
delays in permitting for federal lands, perennial concerns there that face carriers that serve some of these hardest to reach parts of our country. Other challenges included increasing costs for steel and concrete, shortages of qualified workers. Some of these, of course, stem from the turmoil that the coronavirus pandemic has caused in many sectors of our economy. Pine Belt Cellular's president, John Nettles, another company uh, that has uh, provided input here as we start to think through these issues here for the commission. And another participant in my Find It, Fix It, Fund It workshop, he underscored those concerns in the conversation just this week. For many small carriers, he explained, changes to their networks have been in a holding pattern for quite some time. But now, obviously, that federal funding is on the way, there is a lot of work to do here. Recognizing those challenges, the order clarifies the factors that WCB will consider in evaluating individual extensions of time for the removal, replacement, and disposal of untrustworthy equipment. I want to thank my colleagues in particular for adding language, noting the availability of extensions for companies that do face delays in federal permitting processes moving forward. The commission, this national security is a whole of government issue. The commission should consider how we can alert our federal partners at these permitting agencies. Those include the Bureau of Land Management, U.S. Forest Service, the U.S. National Park Service, uh, to what is clearly a national security imperative. And so finally, as we applaud, of course, our country's progress towards more secure communications, we must also remember that many of our international partners are still navigating the process of identifying untrustworthy equipment in their networks, setting out a plan to address that threat. And so we know that communications don't stop at the water's edge. Global security requires international cooperation, and so the United States should continue to lead both by our example and offering technical assistance to our allies. And so to close, as I've done so many times over the last two years that we've addressed these issues each time, I want to thank the numerous commission staff members who have devoted years, truly, to this challenging and sensitive work. And so assessing these threats posed by untrustworthy equipment, working with affected carriers, building a firm legal and factual foundation and record for our path forward have all required expertise and dedication. So I'm deeply pleased to approve this order and uh, working forward with the FCC colleagues and all to get the reimbursement funds into the field as quickly as possible. So thank you for the hard work. Thank you, Commissioner Starks, for your statement and your work on this. Uh, Commissioner Symington. Thank you. Uh, this is a timely action that uh, will contribute not only to national security, but also to carrying out the program as specified for us by Congress. So um, uh, it gives me great pleasure to support this item. And thanks very much to the, the staff for their excellent work on this. Thank you, commissioners. In the United States, our communication systems are built on trust. We trust that our calls go through. We trust that our communications are free of unlawful surveillance. We trust that our networks are open to all without threat to national security or fundamental human rights. This trust in our communication systems is essential, but sustaining it requires effort. It requires that we identify threats to this trust and take actions to address them, and that is what we do here today. And of course, to understand why it requires a bit of explanation. Several years ago, the Federal Communications Commission began an effort to prevent insecure equipment like that from Huawei and ZTE from being used in communications networks supported by our universal service programs. We recognized then what we know clearly right now. There is a serious risk that this equipment may be manipulated, disrupted, or controlled by foreign actors. Its presence threatens the very trust we require in our communication systems. Now, Congress chose to address this threat more broadly by setting an ambitious goal, removing this equipment from our communications networks wherever it may exist. And it came up with a plan for achieving this goal in the Secure and Trusted Communications Networks Act. And later, it appropriated nearly $1.9 billion to see this plan through. Then, in the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021, it adjusted the plan to ensure that this goal is fully realized. As a result of all of this legislative activity, the FCC will soon undertake 
what is perhaps the most significant federally funded effort to rebuild and secure commercial communications networks nationwide. This means we will evaluate network after network, base station after base station, and router after router until we have rooted out our equipment that could undermine national security. It's a daunting task. That's because removing insecure equipment from existing networks after installation is hard. Historically, these systems are closed and deeply integrated with little opportunity to mix and match equipment from different vendors. But going forward, we can do this differently. Most importantly, undertaking this process provides us with an opportunity to demonstrate for the world how to build a more secure future for 5G networks. Now, tackling a big goal like this requires many small and consistent steps. In December, with my predecessor at the helm, this agency adopted its first rules implementing the Secure and Trusted Communications Networks Act. In February, we proposed changes in order to incorporate amendments to the law that were adopted in the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. In March, we released a draft catalog itemizing expenses and suggesting replacements for insecure equipment. In April, we selected an administrator to run the nearly $1.9 billion reimbursement program. And in May, we sought further comment from stakeholders about outstanding program details. That's a lot of forward steps. And today we're taking another important one. We put the finishing touches on the reimbursement program. Specifically, we harmonized the past work of this agency with new appropriations legislation. This means raising the eligibility cap for those participating. It means modifying rules about how reimbursement funds can be used. And it also means updating prioritization policies in the event that reimbursement costs exceed available funding. But above all, it means we are getting going. In fact, with this step underway, I am pleased to announce that October 29th is now our target date for opening the window for the reimbursement program. That means carriers can start planning for their applications and their new networks. There's a lot of work to do. And as we strive to meet this target, the FCC will continue our work to ensure that secure alternatives exist. We want companies cutting out high risk hardware from their networks to have the opportunity to use trusted alternatives, including traditional end-to-end -end proprietary gear, as well as promising newer alternatives like interoperable open radio access network solutions or open RAN. In fact, on Wednesday of this week, the FCC will hold a two-day virtual open RAN showcase that will give network operators interested in the reimbursement program an opportunity to hear directly from vendors whose interoperable open interface standards-based 5G network equipment and services will be ready and available for purchase and installation this year. This showcase is an opportunity to jumpstart United States innovation in this critical technology. So thank you to my colleagues for their support for today's effort and their understanding that trust in our communications networks is essential. Thank you also to the many, many staff who worked on this initiative, and it was an all hands effort. So that includes Pam Arlick, Allison Baker, Ahuva Batams, Callie Coker, Brian Cruikshank, Elizabeth Kuttner, Justin Fall, Victoria Goldberg, Christopher Coves, Billy Layton, Lee McFarland, Chris Monteith, Brian Palmer, Doug Slotten, Gil Strobel, and Mariah Windus of the Wireline Competition Bureau. Garnet Hanley, Carrie Hicks, Robert Krinsky, George Leeds, Charles Mathias, John Shabel, Blaise Sinto, and Sean Spivey of the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. Charlene Goldfield, Jeffrey Goldthorpe, Deb Jordan, Nikki McGinnis, Zenji Nakahawa, and Austin Randazzo of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. Patrick Brogan, Tanner Hinkle, Eugene Kislev, Kenneth Lynch, Chuck Needy, Eric Ralph, and Emily Talaga of the Office of Economics and Analytics, Maura McGowan of the Office of Communications Business Opportunities, Dan Daly and Mark Stevens of the Office of Managing Director, and Marlena Barzilai, Michelle Ellison, Andrea Kelly, Doug Klein, Rick Mallon, Bill Richardson, and Shin Yu of the Office of General Counsel. And with that, we're going to proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approved. Commissioner Symington. Approved. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. 
Madam Secretary, please announce the next item on today's agenda. Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, the second item today is entitled Amendment of Section 15.255 of the Commission's Rules and will be presented by the Office of Engineering and Technology. Ron Rapati, Acting Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Mr. Rapazzi, please proceed with introducing item number two on today's agenda. Thank you and good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. OET is pleased to present for your consideration a notice of proposed rulemaking that would revise the technical rules in section 15.255 of the Commission's rules. The proposals would permit expanded flexibility for unlicensed field disturbance sensors, such as radars, to better share the 60 gigahertz band with other authorized spectrum users and foster the development of radar devices that could bring new and innovative applications and services to consumers that are not available today. Bauman Bodipur, the chief of OET's technical rules branch in the policy and rules division will present the item. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. The item before you is a notice of proposed rulemaking that proposes to revise the Commission's rules to provide expanded operational flexibility to new and innovative unlicensed field disturbance sensor devices, including radar that can operate in the 57 to 71 gigahertz range under section 15.255 of the rules. Unlicensed devices that currently operate in this band generally include wide gig and other indoor and outdoor wireless local area networking devices, outdoor fixed point-to-point -point communication links and short range field disturbance sensors and radar operations. Our current rules limit power level of field disturbance sensors and radar devices to 30 dB below, of below that of unlicensed communication devices. This states in 1995 when the Commission sought to foster the development of high-speed communication devices in this space. Recent advancements have led to an increased demand for unlicensed mobile radar operations under Section 15.255, particularly in the 57 to 64 gigahertz range. This is due to more readily available high-frequency, low-cost chipsets, as well as the potential for manufacturers to develop products that can be used both within the United States and abroad. The Commission also recently granted waivers to a number of parties to operate vehicle cabin mounted radars at higher power than permitted in the rules to detect children left unattended in passenger vehicles and touchless devices for healthcare related applications. The proposals to update and streamline the rules for the 60 gigahertz operation recognizes the value in promoting compatibility with unlicensed communication operations that have long been permitted in the band and are carefully crafted to ensure that all unlicensed operations do not cause harmful interference to license and authorize federal and non-federal users that operate in the band. Specifically, the NPRM proposes to allow all FDS devices that limit their operating frequencies to the 57 to 64 gigahertz portion of the band to transmit at a maximum of, maximum of 20 dBm EIRP, 13 dBm per megahertz average EIRP power spectral density, and 10 dBm transmitted conducted output power along with a maximum 10% duty cycle restriction within any 33 milliseconds interval. The NPRM also seeks input on permitting radar devices that incorporate listen before talk or other methods of spectrum sensing to operate across the entire 57 to 71 gigahertz span at the same power level as currently is permitted for 60 gigahertz communication devices. This means they would be able to transmit at 40 dBm EIRP instead of the proposed 20 dBm EIRP. And finally, the NPRM requests comments on the potential for the mobile FDS devices to operate in the 61 to 61.5 gigahertz band at the same 40 dBm 
EIRP at which FDS devices currently are permitted to operate. Staff recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges solely for technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear any comments from the bench. Mr. Merkar. Thank you. Since 2017, the FCC has made significant progress on opening up the airwaves needed for next generation services, including 5G. By the end of last year, our efforts freed up more than six gigahertz of spectrum for licensed use, in addition to thousands of megahertz for unlicensed use. So I'm pleased that we're starting another spectrum proceeding today that will look at authorizing new and innovative uses in the 60 gigahertz range. Of course, there's much more work ahead to maintain US leadership in wireless. One of the challenges we faced back in 2017 was the absence of mid-band spectrum in the pipeline. So we went to work and put a plan in place to turn things around. We held the first auction of mid-band spectrum in 2020 with 70 megahertz worth of spectrum in the 3.5 gigahertz band. At 2.5 gigahertz, we transformed the rules governing nearly 200 megahertz worth of this mid-band spectrum to support 5G builds and teed up over 100 megahertz for auction. At 4.9 gigahertz, we modernized regulation of a 50 megahertz swath of spectrum, and that decision almost even went uh, into effect. In the L band, we authorized 30 megahertz of spectrum for 5G and IoT. At 5.9, we opened up 45 megahertz for unlicensed, plus we pushed out an additional 1200 megahertz for unlicensed use in the six gigahertz band. And of course, there's the big kahuna, the C band, where we cleared 280 megahertz of sought after mid-band spectrum. Now, these were not all walks in the park. In many cases, these were spectrum bands that prior FCCs took a pass on, not because the bands were unsuited for next-gen wireless, but because moving forward meant taking political heat for doing the right thing. In fact, we would still be hundreds of megahertz behind and stuck in neutral while our global counterparts passed us by if we heeded calls for inaction by some in Washington. We need to be clear-eyed about our spectrum policy going forward. For the U.S. to extend its leadership, we need to match the pace and cadence we hit over the past few years on spectrum auctions and authorizations. The challenge today is not an empty spectrum cover. It's making sure we maintain the progress that we've been making. And that's why I released a spectrum calendar back in March. Hitting the milestones in that calendar will ensure the U.S. stays on track. And there are several spectrum actions I highlighted for the FCC to accomplish this year. For one, we should ensure the 3.45 gigahertz auction stays on track, while we now have locked in an October start date, which is great news. We should continue to ensure productive collaboration between federal users and prospective bidders, particularly over the next few weeks, to ensure a successful auction. For another, we should auction the remaining 2.5 gigahertz licenses before the end of this year. We teed up a 2021 auction through a public notice that we released in early January, and getting this done would unlock another 100 plus megahertz of prime mid-band spectrum. FCC should also start a proceeding this year that explores new opportunities for unlicensed operations in what's known as the Uni 2C band, 5470 to 5725 megahertz, including for very low power operations. We should see comment this year too on increasing power levels for CBRS operations in 3.5 gigahertz. In fact, next week marks uh, a one year anniversary of the start of the CBRS auction. Now that the band is being used, we can take that real world experience and explore the benefits and possibilities of raising power levels to potentially maximize the potential of that band. Finally, we should adopt an order this year that permits additional uses in the six gigahertz band for very low power devices and device to device communication. As I laid out back in March, all of this can be done this year and would demonstrate that we are keeping the pedal down on spectrum. The calendar I put out also proposed concrete actions on several additional bands in 2022 and beyond, but I will save some time today and not uh, reiterate those here in my statement. 
So stepping back, the good news is that we have plenty of spectrum in the pipeline. It's on us at the FCC to make sure we stick to this schedule and get it out into the market. I'm happy to work with my FCC colleagues and any stakeholder on proceedings that would do just that. And as for the spectrum item before us today, I'd like to offer, offer my thanks and appreciation to the staff of OET for their hard work on this item, uh, as well as the chair uh, for bringing this item forward. It has my support. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Carr. Commissioner Starks. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. It is astonishing how quickly cutting edge technology can move from the drawing board to becoming a part of our daily lives. And so like many technologies that have come before it from the automobile to the smartphone, advancements in field disturbance radar technology do have the potential to transform how consumers interact with their environments and each other on a regular basis. And so field disturbance radars have already been approved uh, to detect children left unattended in the backseat of a vehicle. Obviously, once deployed, this is technology that could save dozens of young lives each year. And as this technology advances, moreover, it has the potential to contribute to other innovative life-saving and life-enhancing functions, as we heard, uh, increasing the monitoring of vulnerable medical patients, increasing home automation, the creation of accessible interfaces for persons with disabilities, and the development of new personal safety devices. And so taking a step back, the commission is responsible for ensuring that our regulations encourage innovation while protecting, of course, the interests of consumers and existing services. And these proposed rules do just that, allowing broader use of the 60 gigahertz band for the development of mobile radar with the assurance that it won't disrupt existing spectrum users. And so I look forward to reviewing the comments in response to this NPRM, which will hopefully pave the way for additional innovative and technological radar developments that can make consumers' lives safer and easier. Thank you uh, to OET for their hard work on this item. Thank you, Commissioner Starks. Commissioner Slimington. Thank you. I'm happy to support today's notice, which seeks comment on updates to our rules that will uh, hopefully facilitate the deployment and development of new technologies in the 60 gigahertz band, while at the same time asking important questions about promoting com compatibility with current unlicensed operations and continuing to ensure that all unlicensed operations allowed in the band will not cause harmful interference to licensed and other authorized users. Thanks very much for the staff for, uh, to the staff for their thorough work on this extremely technical item. Thank you, commissioners. There's a radar revolution happening across our economy. It used to be that radar sensing technology was devoted mostly to military uses, detecting the presence, distance, and direction of objects by sending out pulses of high-frequency electromagnetic waves. But there's been a lot of scientific and technical progress over the past few years, and nowadays we are seeing its use in all sorts of commercial applications. This is exciting because the innovations are coming fast. Radar sensing technology is being used to support the development of gesture control, which could allow you to turn on the lights or turn up the heat with a flick of the wrist. It's being used to develop new systems for real-time traffic management that can reduce congestion and increase roadway safety. It's also being used to develop robotics to improve workplace safety and medical imaging and monitoring technologies to help us lead healthier lives. And most recently, it has been used to monitor for children left in hot cars and trigger alerts that could help save their lives. That's a lot of potential, but here's the thing. The FCC's technical rules for the 60 gigahertz band are actually holding some of this activity back. That's because our rules for this band confine radar manufacturers to what might be overly conservative power limits and other dated requirements. So today we are taking action to bring our spectrum policies for radar technology up to speed. Specifically, we're launching a rulemaking that will explore technical changes to our rules for the 60 gigahertz band to create more opportunities for higher power radar use. At the same time, we are taking steps to ensure that all of this new innovation can coexist with other services that are already making use of this spectrum like YGIG. To this end, 
a broad group of stakeholders with interest in unlicensed technology and communications device systems have been meeting and discussing these matters under the auspices of the 60 gigahertz coexistence study group. This rulemaking benefits immensely from their efforts. In fact, many of the questions we asked today are informed by their work and we are grateful for it. I'm also grateful to the team who worked on this creative effort to expand the use of unlicensed airwaves, including Damian Ariza, Bauman Badapur, David Duarte, Michael Hawk, Kevin Holmes, Steve Jones, Ira Kelts, Nicholas Oros, Siobhan Philemon, Jameson Prime, Ron Rapazzi, Hugh Van Tile, and Ann Wordy from the Office of Engineering and Technology. Catherine Schroeder, Jessica Quinley, and Joel Taubenblatt from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. Patrick Brogan, Jonathan Campbell, Rachel Kazan, Julia McHenry, Michelle Schaefer, Donald Stockdale, and Patrick Sun from the Office of Economics and Analytics. Deborah Broderson, David Horowitz, and Bill Richardson from the Office of General Counsel, and Maura McGowan from the Office of Communications Business Opportunities. And with that, we will proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. And the chair votes aye. This item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Madam Secretary, please announce the next item on today's agenda. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, Commissioners. The fourth item today entitled, uh, entitled uh, Mandatory Electronic Filing of Section 3.5C, excuse me, the third item, Applications, international broadcast applications, and dominant carrier section 63.10C quarterly reports will be presented by the International Bureau, and Tom Sullivan, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Mr. Sullivan, please proceed. Thank you. Good morning, Chairwoman Rosenworcel and Commissioners. The order before you today marks an important step in ensuring that all International Bureau filings are submitted to the Commission electronically. Today's action continues the Commission's work over the past several decades of streamlining its processes by mandating the electronic filing of applications and other filings related to telecommunications services. The order will provide a number of benefits to applicants, carriers, and Commission staff including cost savings, convenience, administrative ease, and speed. I would like to thank the staff from the International Bureau, Media Bureau, Office of Economics and Analytics, Office of Managing Director, and Office of General Counsel for their collaborative work on this item. Clay DeSell of the International Bureau will present the item. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman. Good morning, Commissioners. The order before you modifies commission rules to mandate the electronic filing of section 325C applications, applications for international high frequency broadcast or IHF stations, and dominant carrier section 63.10C quarterly reports. And it also removes a duplicate paper filing requirement for satellite cost recovery declarations. Currently, for international licenses, authorizations, or other filings processed by the International Bureau, nearly all applications must be filed electronically through the International Bureau Filing System, IBFS, including all applications for international and satellite services when an IBFS form is available. The exceptions to mandatory electronic filing in IBFS remain for Section 325C applications, IHF applications, and dominant carrier Section 63.10C quarterly reports. Section 325C and IHF applications are submitted through a modified electronic filing process that involves filing a non-docketed pleading through the Commission's electronic comment filing system. For dominant carrier Section 63.10C quarterly reports, certain authorization holders are required to mail a paper copy to the Commission within 90 days from the end of each calendar quarter. A party required to provide satellite cost recovery declarations under Section 25111D of the Commission's rules must submit a paper copy to the International Bureau's Satellite Division in addition to the version it files electronically. This order eliminates the paper mailing and modified electronic filing requirements for Section 325C applications and IHF applications and requires applicants to file electronically an IBFS 
when electronic forms are available. For dominant carrier section 63.10C quarterly reports, the order eliminates the paper filing option and requires carriers to submit these reports electronically in IBFS within 90 days after the end of each calendar quarter. The order also revises section 63.10D of the commission's rules to remove an erroneous reference. Finally, the order removes the duplicate paper filing requirement for satellite cost recovery declarations. This order and corresponding rule changes will reduce costs and administrative burdens, result in greater efficiencies, facilitate faster and more efficient communications, and improve transparency for the public. The International Bureau recommends adoption of this item and requests editorial privileges for technical and conforming edits. Thank you. We will now hear any comments from the bench, and we'll begin with Commissioner Carr. Uh, thank you to the team for their work on the item. It has my support. Appreciate it. Commissioner Starks. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, similarly, thank you to the team for their hard work on, on this important item and uh, deeply appreciate it. Commissioner Symington. Uh, I support today's order. Thanks very much to the IB staff for their hard work on this. Moving fast. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. Back in the day, if you wanted to file something with the FCC, it had to be done on paper. It was slow and not all that efficient. But in the last quarter of a century, really since the Telecommunications Act of 1996, the agency has been on a tear to update our filing systems to reflect the realities of the digital age. But here's the thing, not every system was updated at the same time and in the same way. Different policies sometimes require different approaches. Different times also require new approaches. That means we need to look at all of our systems at the FCC and ensure that they are right for right now. For instance, there is work to do to modernize the ECFS system to improve security and the public's ability to engage with the agency on important issues. And we're on it. There's also work to do to update the agency's broadcast and cable files to ensure they're machine readable. And today we update the International Bureau Filing System or IBFS. It was introduced back in 1998, and at this point, most of its filings are electronic, but some applications and reports still require the filing of a paper copy. We eliminate those rules today and update the system to support electronic filing of these documents. That means better service at lower cost. And to all of those who worked on this item, including Kathleen Campbell, Denise Coca, Kimberly Cook, Clay DeSalle, Neshe Gundelsberger, Francis Gutierrez, Jocelyn Tazeremi, Carl Kensiger, Cal Krautnummer, David Kretsch, Olga Magduga, Forty, James McLucky, Catherine Medley, Brandon Moss, Catherine O'Brien, Tom Sullivan, and Cheryl Williams from the International Bureau. A hefty thank you and also a thank you to Andrew Kennedy, Barbara Kreisman, Al Sheldoner, and Sarah Whitesell from the Media Bureau, Susan Aaron, Andrea Kearney, Dave Comscal, Elizabeth Lyle, Bill Richardson, and Jeffrey Steinberg from the Office of General Counsel, and Kathy Williams from the Office of the Managing Director. And with that, we're going to proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. The chair votes aye, and the item is adopted with editorial privileges as requested. Madam Secretary, please announce the next item on today's agenda. Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners, last on your agenda, fourth, is an enforcement action for your consideration. Some item will be presented by the Enforcement Bureau, and Chris Killian, Deputy Chief of the Bureau, will introduce the item. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And now for the regular language. Because this order is an enforcement-related matter, we are again going to switch the order up just slightly, as the FCC has done in past cases that involved the presentation of an enforcement item at an open meeting. As with all open meeting items, the Bureau circulated this to every commissioner at least three weeks ago, but there is a long-standing practice at the agency that we do not publicly disclose the target of an enforcement action unless and until the commission decides to take that action. For this item, that means that the agency formally votes on the item, then hears a brief presentation from the Bureau before proceeding to any statements that the commissioners may have, this process ensures that the target will not be publicly disclosed until the FCC has voted to take action. We're following that precedent here, so we will now proceed directly to a vote on the item. 
With respect to item number four on the agenda, Commissioner Carr. Approve. Commissioner Starks. Approve. Commissioner Symington. Approve. The chair votes aye. The item is adopted with editorial privileges if requested. Uh, Mr. Killian, please proceed with introducing the item on today's agenda. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. Thank you for your consideration and your votes on today's item, a memorandum of opinion and order against Mobile Relay Associates. Presenting with me is Senior Field Counsel Matt Gibson. I'd like to thank uh, Jeremy Mimarcus, who is Associate Bureau Chief, Ashley Tyson, Legal Advisor in the Enforcement Bureau, Axel Rodriguez, Field Director, Janet Moran, Deputy Field Director, Lark Hadley, Regional Director, Joy Ragsdale, Field Counsel, and the agents from our Los Angeles Field Office who investigated this case for their work on this matter. I would also like to thank the Office of General Counsel and the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau for their support. Matt will now present the item. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, Madam Chairwoman and Commissioners. This memorandum opinion and order denies Mobile Relay Associates application for review of an earlier Enforcement Bureau order that affirmed a $25,000 forfeiture against the company for violations of the Commission's Part 90 rules. Mobile Relay operated its land mobile radio system on a near continuous basis on a shared channel, failed to employ sufficient monitoring equipment, and caused harmful interference to another licensee. Today's action furthers the Commission's goals by ensuring that licensees operating on shared spectrum actually share the spectrum. Following complaints from private land mobile licensees also operating in the Los Angeles market, the Bureau opened an investigation into Mobile Relay's alleged misconduct. Enforcement Bureau field agents observed that Mobile Relay was operating on a near continuous basis on a licensed frequency designated for shared use with other area licensees and was causing harmful interference to operations by other licensees. The Bureau issued a notice of violation to Mobile Relay for failing to restrict the station's transmissions to the minimum practical duration, for failing to monitor, uh, to monitor transmitting frequencies for, of other licensees, and for failing to take reasonable precautions to avoid causing harmful interference. In response, Mobile Relay claimed that its use of the shared channel did not violate the Commission's rules and that it had reduced the station's transmitting power in an attempt to mitigate the interference. Two years later, the Bureau caught Mobile Relay engaging in the same misconduct and acting the same, one of the same co-channel licensees and proposed a $25,000 fine. Mobile Relay opposed the fine, which the Bureau upheld. Mobile Relay then asked the Bureau to reconsider that decision, and the Bureau again affirmed the $25,000 fine. Following the Bureau's dismissal of the petition for reconsideration, Mobile Relay filed an application for review that puts the matter before the Commission for decision. In its application, Mobile Relay makes two notice arguments and asserts that the Bureau abused prosecutorial discretion um, by treating the company differently from similarly situated licensees. First, Mobile Relay argues that the Bureau denied it due process because, despite the company's request, the Bureau did not notify the company that its unilateral mitigation efforts were insufficient before issuing the NAL. This contention is without merit. The Commission has long held that the agency satisfies its due process obligations when it issues a notice of apparent liability for forfeiture in compliance with Section 503 of the Communications Act and affords the parties an opportunity to be heard before imposing any sanction. As a result, the Commission is not obligated to notify a licensee of an investigation before proposing a fine in an NAL. By the same token, licensees are ultimately responsible for ensuring their compliance with the Commission's rules. Second, Mobile Relay asserts that the Bureau failed to provide sufficient notice that its 95% occupancy rate on the shared channel violated the Commission's Part 90 rules. This argument is also unpersuasive. The forfeiture against Mobile Relay was not based solely on the company's monopolization of a shared channel. Rather, the underlying $25,000 forfeiture was based on the totality of Mobile Relay's specific conduct. This included heavy use of a shared channel, plus inadequate monitoring to avoid causing interference, plus harmful, actual harmful interference to another licensee. Thus, it is not necessary for the Commission to quantify a specific bright line occupancy rate 
uh, with respect to the minimum practical transmission time referenced in the rules for mobile relay to have been on notice regarding proper use of a shared channel. Mobile Relay also argues that the Bureau abused its prosecutorial discretion by treating Mobile Relay differently from similarly situated licensees. The two, um, the two investigations that Mobile Relay cites in its application for review are factually distinct from the present case, meaning that Mobile Relay is not a similarly situated licensee for purposes of a disparate treatment analysis. Further, the Bureau has demonstrated that in a subsequent case involving similar violations, it also imposed a $25,000 forfeiture, which is consistent with the magnitude of the forfeiture imposed against Mobile Relay. For these reasons and the additional detail laid out in the Memorandum Opinion and Order, the Enforcement Bureau appreciates the Commission's adoption of this item and the grant of editorial privileges. Thank you. Thank you. I'm pleased we can highlight the good work of our field offices here today. We will now hear any comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner Carr. No, no separate statement for me. Thanks to the team for your work on this. Commissioner Starks. Yes, no statement from me. Um, but as you mentioned, Madam Chairman, thank you to uh, the field for all the hard work that you do. And, and um, this item does reflect that uh, that continuing work that they do out in the field. Thank you. Commissioner Symington. No separate statement except to express my appreciation to the Bureau. Thanks very much. Thank you, Commissioners. You know, it was 2013 when the FCC's field office in Los Angeles first issued a notice of violation against Mobile Relay Associates. It alleged that Mobile Relay Associates was operating on a station on a channel that it was supposed to share, causing harmful interference to others who are playing by the rules. And this was the beginning of a long process and one, quite frankly, that takes too long. In his series of filings, Mobile Relay Associates contested the findings of our field office, disputing the initial notice of violation and even subsequent enforcement activity. We have now given them time. We have carefully considered each argument. But we now bring the effort that began in 2013 to conclusion and affirm the monetary forfeiture against the company. I believe that with interference allegations like this, the agency can act more swiftly while also fulfilling its due process obligations. After all, our airwaves are getting more crowded, which means that we are facing new sources of interference to a resource that is increasingly important to our economic and national security. That is why I'm having the agency develop new timeliness goals for case resolution. I believe that doing so will foster fairer and more consistent enforcement with better results for the public. Thank you to the Enforcement Bureau for the many years they have spent on this effort, including Matt Gibson, Mark Hadley, Rosemary Harold, Christopher Killian, Jeremy Marcus, Janet Moran, Joy Ragsdale, Axel Rodriguez, Ashley Tyson, and the field agents in the Los Angeles field office. Thank you also to David Horowitz, Linda Oliver, William Richardson, and Anjali Singh from the Office of General Counsel, and Lloyd Coward and Jessica Quinley from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. And before I bring this meeting to a close, let me ask if my colleagues have any announcements they'd like to make at this time. We'll start with Commissioner Carr. Nothing new for me, thank you. Ah, Commissioner Stark. Nothing to report by me either. Commissioner Symington. Nothing to announce at this time, thank you. Well, I'm not gonna be that quick. <laughs> I should warn you, we have a, a lot of personnel announcements that I'd like to make. First, Julie Saulnier will be retiring at the end of this month after nearly 20 years of service at the FCC. During her time at the agency, she demonstrated her versatility and skill through her work in four bureaus, WCB, CGB, IB, and most recently, MB, on a very wide range of issues. I personally had the pleasure of working with Julie many years ago when she was in the Wireline Competition Bureau, and more recently, I was so pleased to see Julie in a leadership role as one of the designated deputy federal officers for the FCC's Advisory Committee on Diversity and Digital Empowerment. While we will miss Julie's continued contributions to the FCC enormously, we wish her family all the best in retirement. Next, Kevin Green is retiring. And while Kevin has worked at the FCC just for the past six years, he actually has a very long and extensive history with the communications sector. Kevin began his career by serving 15 and a half years in the US Air Force as a telecommunications system operator. 
He then worked at Verizon before joining the Media Bureau's Industry Analysis Division as a policy analyst. And despite the range of issues he's worked on during his time at the agency, Kevin tells us that his most rewarding project at the commission has been his work on the COVID-19 telehealth program. And in particular, the opportunity to see the direct and immediate benefits the program provided to so many people in underserved areas. I honestly don't know if we can afford to let Kevin go after an admission like that, but we wish him and his family all the best. Next, Kurt Schroeder will be retiring from the agency at the end of the month after, whoa, 32 years of dedicated public service. Kurt has played significant roles in so many of our biggest consumer protection efforts, including combating unwanted and illegal robocalls, junk faxes, and slamming. Kurt's done so as a staff attorney and a manager in the Enforcement Bureau and the former Common Carrier Bureau, and he retires after several years as division chief of CGB's Consumer Policy Division. We'll miss his deep knowledge of the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, as well as commission procedure, but we also salute his leadership and dedication to the public interest over these last three decades. So we're not done yet. Greg Cook is retiring on July 30th after 26 years of the commission. Greg started in 1995 as an attorney in what was then the Common Carrier Bureau's Tariff Division, and then he moved to the Network Services and Policy Divisions before launching a nearly 20-year stint as a public safety manager. After 9-11, Greg worked extensively on the emergency alert system as the deputy director of the Enforcement Bureau's Office of Homeland Security, and later as an associate and deputy chief in the newly created Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau Policy Division. Then Greg moved in 2019 to become chief of the FCC Office of Intergovernmental Affairs, and he led the commission's outreach and education to state and local governments to foster an understanding of a whole range of FCC programs, policies, rules, and decisions. And here's a, a fact that not everyone knows. During his FCC years, Greg was a member of the Screen Actors Guild and somehow managed to find time to appear as an FBI agent in two episodes of Homicide, Life on the Street. He's also run eight marathons, including the Boston Marathon, and completed the Chesapeake Bay Bridge Swim and was certified as a yoga instructor. So we thank Greg for living life to the fullest and his dedicated public service. We wish him the best in the next chapter of his life. Next, Mark Lueth is retiring July 31st after working for the FCC for 13 years as a field agent and as a field agent specifically in the Chicago office. And that actually follows on an even longer career in government service and private practice. He spent 26 years in the United States Navy. His personal career highlights at the FCC include working on Hurricane Harvey and the DTV transition project. He tells us he's looking forward to spending more time with his wife, Kathy, and their three children and four grandchildren. And now from one mark to another, Dr. Mark Bykowski is leaving the FCC at the end of the month after a 20 year career, having joined the FCC in July of, 20, of 2001. After a stint in industry, he actually started his government service at NTIA, where he was awarded a 1995 bronze medal from the Department of Commerce for assistance he provided the FCC in the design and operation of its earliest spectrum auctions. Mark's most valuable contributions at the FCC have included work on our media, broadband, and spectrum policies. And to this last point, Mark was awarded three Excellence in Economic Analysis Awards for research he has conducted on spectrum policy issues. His work explored solutions involving the inefficient coexistence of radio systems, the inefficient assignment of spectrum between licensed and unlicensed use, inefficient use of unlicensed spectrum under conditions of congestion, and the problem of poor radio receiver quality, which is something I was just speaking to Commissioner Simonton about yesterday. He also made valuable contributions to morale at the FCC. He is responsible for something not everyone might know about, but a giant FCC monopoly game that supported the combined federal campaign and took up about one third of the old FCC commission meeting room when it was displayed. Finally, it's with great sadness that I mentioned the passing of a former colleague and friend from the Wireline Competition Bureau and a member of the FCC family. Sherwin C. joined the agency as special counsel in the Competition Policy Division of the FCC's Wireline Competition Bureau back in January of 2016. He was absolutely integral to the agency's privacy and numbering administration work. 
Prior to his time at the agency, and after departing the commission in October 2018, Sherwin worked on a whole range of technology policy issues with a special focus on copyright, privacy, and intellectual property law. He was a terrific colleague and really a friend to so many. And on behalf of the Wireline Competition Bureau, all his friends at the FCC, we offer our deepest sympathies to his family. And now if my colleagues don't have any further announcements, Madam Secretary, please announce the date of the next FCC meeting. The next item in the meeting of the Federal Communications Commission is Thursday, August 5th, 2021. Until then, we stand adjourned.